Hi students, teachers, and everybody else who's helped to make this channel such a success. We've just passed 4,000 subscribers and over half a million views, and I'm pretty proud of all of that, but it's not about me, it's about you. And so what I wanna do, partly, I guess as a thank you for all the people who've supported this channel over the years, and also to continue that um, quality content, I guess, that we've been trying to put out all this time, uh, is to launch something new. And the new is practical science. So what we want to do in this series of videos is to produce a number of different experiments for you. Tiny Science Lab have provided a lot of the equipment that we're going to be using here and my sincere thanks to Jacob Strickland um, for his support. As soon as I saw this stuff I thought I have to have a go, I have to get my own set and uh, start to have a play. So that's what we're going to be doing, we're going to be using the Tiny Science Lab. So there's going to be quite a few close-ups. Uh, so you can see what's going on. This particular experiment is a single displacement reaction. It's designed to show you something about the theory of redox couples, that is reduction oxidation, and we're going to have a little bit of a look. Now you can expand this particular experiment to create what we call a galvanic cell, but for today, I just wanna give you a little bit of a look at some calculations associating the mole concept with this particular reaction and to see exactly what we can produce from this reaction. Because I wanna make sure that I'm modeling good chemistry to you, I'm in my PPE, and I'm also going to make sure that I record all of my values in my little book so that I can keep track of these for later on. It also means that I can share these with you as we go through this experiment. The first component of this reaction is magnesium. There's a small amount of magnesium here. I'm going to take one of the strips out. So there's one of my strips of magnesium. Now what I want to do first of all is I want to weigh this. So I'll make sure we tar it first. I've got a small strip of magnesium of 0 0.06 grams. So I'm going to write that down. In the periodic table, that magnesium is here. It's in group two. So magnesium has a, uh, is an active metal, and that's one of the important things that I need to be aware of for this particular reaction. The other thing that I'm going to note from the periodic table is that the atomic mass of magnesium is 24.31. Now what I need to do is I need to be able to do a small calculation. The calculation is going to tell me how many moles of magnesium I need. In order to do this, I'm going to put this up on the whiteboard. So our calculation for the number of moles is mass divided by molar mass, which in this case is 0 0.06 grams, divided by 24.31 grams per mole to give me a value of 2.47 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. So let me just record that one. What I'm doing is I'm going to try and displace a less active metal iron from a solution using a more active metal in its uh, elemental solid form. To do that, I'm going to use the ion copper. So this is a solution, or well, this isn't a solution, this is actually solid copper sulfate, but I'm going to make a solution out of it. But one of the things that I'm going to try and do in order to see if I can get my values pretty close on is I'm going to write the equation for this reaction. If this reaction works, then magnesium solid, when combined with copper ions in solution, should produce magnesium ions in solution and precipitate the copper as a solid. Now, fortunately, the reaction that I've chosen is a one-to-one -one reaction, which means that the number of moles of copper should be equal to the number of moles of magnesium. So my mole ratio is one to one to one to one. 
That means that if the number of moles of magnesium is 2.47 times 10 to the minus three, then because the ratio is the same, then I should be able to displace 2.47 times 10 to the minus three moles of copper. But I don't know what 2.47 times 10 to three moles of copper is, but I can measure a mass. Here is copper. Copper is in this region of transition metals. Transition metals are quite complex metals and ones that we won't have a look at in detail today. But the one thing about a lot of these transition metals is they are less reactive than the um, alkali metals or the alkaline earth metals, which of one of which is magnesium. So we're hoping that the magnesium is gonna push the copper ions out of the solution it's gonna take their place in the solution, which means the copper is going to be able to um, form a precipitate. You'll notice too that the copper has a mass of 63.55. This time, because it's a powder, I'm going to collect it in my filter paper. So I need to tie that again. You can see if I can measure out 0.16. So we now have 0.16 grams of copper sulfate. We're going to transfer this into the beaker. Now I'm not going to pop my magnesium in straight away. What I want to do is make a solution first. So you can see I've got uh, a 10 mil beaker here. What I'm going to do is I need to make sure that I can dissolve all of my copper sulfate to make a copper sulfate solution. So I'm going to use my beautiful little wash bottle. I'm going to measure 5 mils. So we have 5 mils. Remember to check from the bottom of the meniscus. I'm going to transfer that into my beaker. I need to give it a little stir. So it's time to see if this displacement reaction is going to work. Perhaps the first thing you might notice is bubbles. Now bubbles is actually telling me that another reaction is occurring. So whenever you see bubbles, hopefully the first thing you're going to go to is there's a gas that's being evolved. So from our original equation, there was no gas involved. There was only the two metals and their ions in solution. So what's going on with this gas? Well, you did notice that the way that I made this solution was to add water to my copper sulfate solid. And so one of the things that's happened is the magnesium being such a reactive metal is also causing a reaction to occur with the water. Now we know that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. And so both of those gases can be produced from the breakdown of water, either the reduction of water or the oxidation of water. And those will be in your table of standard reduction potentials. You may also now see that some little flakes are starting to appear in this solution we're getting a precipitate. So there is definitely a reaction that's occurring. There's a precipitate that's forming and there are also bubbles that are being produced. So you can have a look at your table of standard reduction potentials and see if you can work out what's actually happening to the water in this case. Are the bubbles bubbles of hydrogen gas or are the bubbles bubbles of oxygen gas? And how could we tell the difference? We're going to try and cut through to the end of this reaction in order for you to see exactly how much copper we've produced in the end. So you can see now that whilst the magnesium hasn't fully reacted, all of the colour has gone out of this solution. We know that the original solution 
of copper sulfate was blue. So therefore, the copper ions have definitely come out of the solution, but I still have some magnesium here. So what we might do with that is take that out of there now. I'm going to give that a small rinse. All right, so we want to give this a little bit of a clean up. Now I'm going to reweigh my piece of magnesium. It hasn't all broken down, so we know that it has not all reacted. So we've dropped the mass of the magnesium from 0 0.06 back to 0 0.04. At the same time, the solution has lost all of its colour. It's colourless. Please don't call it clear. Call it colourless because it's the colour that changed that's important here. But there's a whole lot of stuff in the bottom as well. There's, there's something that's precipitated out, a solid that's come out of the solution that's now precipitated. So we need to collect that. So one of the things that we need to do is we're going to filter so we can recover the residue. Uh, but before we do that, we want to make sure that we've weighed a piece of filter paper first. So I'm just gonna pop this on here. And my filter paper mass is 0.33 grams. So what we're going to do is take a piece of filter paper and I'm gonna fold that in half and then in half again. And then I'm going to make a little funnel out of it, like this. I'm going to pop it in here, and I'm just going to add a little bit of the solution. And then I'm going to use my stirring rod. I'm trying to do now is separate the water. We don't want the water in this case. There may well be some ions left in the solution, but we're going to try and concentrate on the precipitate. So what we'll do is we'll filter this, we'll get rid of all of the water, and hopefully all of the precipitate will sit in the filter paper. So that'll be our residue, and then we'll need to dry the filter paper and then weigh that. So you can see now that we've pretty much removed all of the filtrate. In fact, I had so much filtrate, I've had to transfer some of it back into my original beaker. That's, that's my, my original beaker, which um, doesn't have the precipitate in it anymore. Here's more of the filtrate that you can see down the bottom here. The residue is in the top. So you can see that we've collected a reasonable amount of residue. I think that's probably just about done. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take my piece of filter paper out. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to reweigh this, but before I do that, at the moment, I'm going to have some additional mass of water that's in there. So I'm going to need to leave that to sit and dry out for a little bit, and then we will reweigh it. Okay, so now that the filter paper is dry, it's time to weigh it. Unfortunately, we've had to bring it inside because there's a bit of wind outside, so it's creating a few little problems, but let's just see what we get here. 0 0.40. So let's record that in the little book. So now it's time to see if we can put all of this information together. Mass of filter paper. 0.33 grams, mass of filter paper plus residue, 0 0.40 grams. Therefore, mass of residue equals 0.4 minus 0 0.33, 0.07. So because we know that the number of moles is mass over molar mass, and we looked at the periodic table, and we found that copper has a molar mass of 
1.10 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. The mole ratio was 1 to 1. The mass of the magnesium will be equal to the number of moles times the molar mass, which is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 3, multiplied by 24. Point three one, and again we get that value from the periodic table, and that is equal to point zero two six. When we check our initial values, so that means that we need to think about some potential sources of error because I looks like I have a little bit more magnesium than what I would have had originally. A couple of things to be aware of here. Firstly, I'm always limited by the um, limit of reading of my devices. So my little electronic balance only measures to two decimal places. Perhaps if it went to three decimal places, then I might be able to have a slightly more accurate uh, reading here. Secondly, you may have noticed that the uh, magnesium strip itself had small deposits of the copper on the actual surface which I didn't clean off before I weighed it which I should have done so that was a source of error and it was one of the ones that we left in there for you to pick through and that would have added a small amount of mass onto the um, magnesium when I reweighed it after the reaction. Thirdly we also saw that during the reaction we had bubbles. So we know that there was some interaction occurring between the magnesium and the water to produce hydrogen gas. And hopefully you've now realized that the gas that was being produced was hydrogen gas. Of course, I could have tested for that gas with, a, with the pop test, or I could have also tried the um, glowing taper test if I thought it might have been oxygen. So sometimes when we see gases or we see bubbles, all we know is that there's a gas. We don't know which gas it is unless we test for it or unless we've got a sensible chemical reason for which particular gas that we're producing. And of course, it's also possible that the water may have been both oxidized and reduced. And that's the principle of electrolysis uh, using a voltameter. But again, that's an experiment for another time. The important thing about this is we call it a single displacement reaction because the magnesium, the more active metal, the magnesium metal has displaced the copper ions from the solution. That is the copper ions have been pushed out of the solution. The magnesium ions are now in the solution. And so therefore, if I collect my filtrate, I should find that I will have some uh, magnesium sulfate now present in my solution. I won't go through that step because this it will end up being a 50 minute video and the idea is for you to get some I just some introduction to some of these very important chemical processes and also to feel comfortable um, playing around with some of these very important figures. You can see for example my little strip of magnesium here it does have just a little bit of copper deposited on the end of it so that could definitely be one of the sources of error in our experiment. How do I get a more accurate result? Well, hopefully one of your responses to that will be, I repeat the experiment. And repetition is a very important part of our test for reliability, but don't forget repetition on its own doesn't confer reliability. We need consistency of results. If we could get some consistent results, then we would have more confidence in our experiment. But we've got some results. The important thing is not the numbers, is that you know what to do with the numbers, that you know where they go, how to substitute them into equations, how to draw out some values for uh, numbers of moles, for masses, and how to make conclusions based on the results that you get. That's it for our first episode of Practical Science. Thanks for watching.